I came to the podium and there was silence. I've never enjoyed such power. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you and the thousands watching the online streaming of this event to this celebration of the 100th anniversary of cooperative education at the Rochester Institute of Technology. My name is Manny Contaminolis. I'm the Associate Vice President, and I'm very privileged to be the Director of RIT's Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services. You know, doing anything for 100 years is noteworthy, but this anniversary is truly historic. In September of 1912, as 32 students began their inaugural co-op assignments with 12 local employers, RIT, which was then known as the Rochester Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute, became the fourth higher education institution in the country to adopt this innovative learning model. Now, 100 years later, students, our employer partners, and the university continue to enjoy the many benefits of this educational approach. Now, I know my obvious youth would suggest to you that I'm a relative newcomer to RIT's cooperative education program. But I must tell you that I have been helping students to find co-op positions and advancing the goals of the university in this area for 33 years. <laughs> Just about a third of the time that the program has been in existence. Now, this means, of course, I was here when RIT celebrated the 75th anniversary of the program. And in this photo, which was taken as part of a news and events article commemorating that anniversary 25 years ago, are Beverly Gaberski, now Beverly Garlop, who was then director of the office, and myself. Now, Bev is happily retired and living in Florida. And unfortunately, as, along with some of the predecessors in our role, Judy Vollmer Miller, Gordon Fuller, and Doug Ford were not able to join us today, but their contributions to the program really should be recognized. As you'll note from this photo, neither my hair nor impressive mustache were able to join us today either. <laughs> now, with this brief personal historical perspective, let me now introduce you to Dr. Jim Miller for some introductory remarks. Jim and I have worked closely for 25 of those 33 years, and our program's success is due in no small part to his leadership, advocacy, and support. Jim. Some places you go, you like to think you knew Manny back when, uh, when he had hair, when he was younger. Uh, I've been here a little bit longer. Distinguished guests, colleagues, students here with us today, those of you joining remotely, let me add my welcome. 100 years of co-op has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? It's a model deeply embedded in the RIT culture one that is often discussed as critical to the learning enterprise, yet one that is very difficult to emulate without the richness of the experiences here at RIT and a small number of other institutions. You see, RIT is not only one of the earliest adopters of the cooperative education model, but also a university today committed fully to experiential education. A university today that recognizes cooperative education at the centerpiece of experiential education. In the United States, fewer than 50 institutions adopted cooperative education before 1967. RIT was not only one of the first, but by the late 1960s had become one of the largest in the United States. Co-op is much more than a program here. It is core to the fabric of an RIT education. It is part of our culture. The pervasiveness of our program, the breadth and depth of our commitment from faculty, 
staff, students, alumni, and employers all contribute to setting the RIT experience apart from most. This vision of co-op traces back to our inception in 1912, but it's articulated very well by George Wilson Hoke in his 1937 book entitled Blazing New Trails. RIT, Hoke said, it was Mechanics Institute, by the way, in 1937, prepares students for the earning of a living and the living of, of a life, not as two separate processes, but as one. Hoke, I believe, was speaking of the orientation of the RIT curricula and the critical role cooperative education played in connecting faculty, students, and employers in the learning enterprise. The goal was to design an integrated and coherent set of learning outcomes relative to our RIT's unique mission rather than treating them as two discrete elements. His work remains relevant today and was utilized as recently as 2009 in RIT's review of its general education curriculum. How deeply rooted then in the culture of RIT is co-op? Let me share eight ways. One, co-op here is an academic program that intentionally alternates periods of co-op work and classroom study to provide a richer, deeper academic learning experience and integrate university-based learning with applied experiences. Two, co-ops required in many programs, optional in others. But every program at RIT has some form of an experiential component. Three, co-op participation results in academic credit and is noted on students' transcripts. Co-op students are evaluated by their employer and also evaluate their co-op experience. These inputs then are used by the individual faculty members to award a passing grade to the student for the experience. Four, assessment data from co-op here are used to document both academic program and university accreditation student outcome goals. Five, because of co-op, faculty use a greater variety of techniques relative to classroom discussion, class projects, team assignments, to integrate student co-op based learning into their experiences when back. Six, faculty join other university representatives in visiting employer work sites and to talking to students while in co-op. Seven, academic department, departmental business advisory boards provide opportunity for faculty to interact directly with corporate representatives to review the co-op program and student performance, as well as to gain a greater understanding of employment trends and emerging business needs. Finally, eight, co-op program participation consistently has opened the door to expanded university business collaboration and partnerships in the areas of funded research, continuing education, and corporate gifts. So, today we come together to celebrate one of the largest co-op programs in the world. Last year, 4,100 RIT students completed over 6,000 work assignments with 2,000 employer partners in 48 states and 40 countries. Students generated through these efforts in excess of $36 million in earnings. Who would have thought in 1912 that it would grow to this? Today, RIT number, alumni number in excess of 106,000 worldwide. I estimate that at least 80,000 of those alumni participated in cooperative education here during their time at RIT. Today, the co-op program at RIT is acknowledged every year by U.S. news and other media sources as one of the best in the country and in the world. Today, the Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services is rated by Princeton Review as one of the 10 best offices in the country. And I might add, what a talented and dedicated 
co-op and career services team we have. We owe much to this group. Today, RIT, the RIT program holds the distinction of being one of the small number of inductees into the Co-op Hall of Fame. Finally, today, the RIT experience is a unique blend of rigor and imagination, of specialization and perspective, of intellect and practice. It is a hub of innovation and creativity. It's a perfect place to pursue one's passion. RIT's institutional culture and climate, I believe, would not be what it has become without the distinct contribution of cooperative education over the last 100 years. On behalf of President Dessler, the RIT administration, the co-op staff, and all in the RIT community, welcome to our centennial celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for those thoughtful comments. And as you can see, uh, Jim is proud of our program and as proud as we are of what we've been able to accomplish. And that, of course, has been due in large part to many of you in the audience who are here with us. You know, RIT's co-op program has consistently enjoyed the unwavering support and commitment of the university's senior leaders. In fact, it was the forward thinking of RIT's first true president, Carlton Gibson, that launched the program. I'm pleased now to be able to share with you today an unprecedented opportunity to hear directly about the importance of the co-op program from all four of RIT's living presidents. My deep interest in RIT's history and especially the almost unbelievable tale of it's now being honored for a full century of cooperative education. This unique experience rising first from the larger community differs from the usual centrality of a college or university first being formed to initiate and lead programs of cooperative education as a joint endeavor of college and business corporations. And the continuing importance of that field, cooperative education, not alone for RIT, but for higher education as a whole in a long and vital model. You know, RIT basically has a reputation for finding jobs or graduate schools for students who graduated. In fact, about 93% of our students have either jobs or are going to graduate school full time just months after graduation. Many of the students today are going to school because they want to uh, be able to uh, have a better life. They want to be able to enter a profession, uh, a field where they can earn an income and support a family, and a new education is valuable, and co-op experience gives them that inside track. When you think of RIT, you think of co-op education. It affects virtually every discipline within the institution, and I think it attracts a certain type of student who knows they're going to get some valuable work experience. The fact that our students really want to get their hands dirty, they want to do the real stuff, they want to go out in industry as soon as possible, learn how things are really done. Well, I think a big part of the reason for that success is the co-op program, the experience that our students get out in the real world. It facilitates the transition from student into the active work life. It is the most valuable experience that students can have. There's a history of co-op students uh, rising all the way to the top of their companies. I think in large part because of the uh, management orientation they had as students, which they then were able to incorporate into the coursework that they took, and each one uh, reinforced the other. The student knows something of that workplace, the philosophy of the employer, and in turn, the employer knows the work habits, the knowledge base of the student. It also, of course, has the added benefit of enlarging our faculty to include business executives and engineers and scientists, creative artists all around the country. 
will help them mentor our students as they progress through their educational programs. Those co-op assignments are not, uh, in, you know, sort of unpaid internships where students, you know, are very happy to put their time in and gain some experience. Uh, these are uh, jobs where the starting salary uh, for a co-op student uh, exceeds sometimes the, the average salary of non-co-op students uh, in, in, in similar fields. The other aspect of co-op is the feedback the institution gets when the students come back from their co-op experience. They bring back with them not only the enthusiasm for, for their experience, but also there's a feedback of information that's reflected in the classroom and laboratories. The nice thing from my perspective is that the, the faculty have to stay current because the students come back from these experiences knowing how it's really done in the real world. The RIT co-op program has changed over the years. Increasingly, we're looking for international co-op experiences for our students. Uh, increasingly, we're faced with global competition uh, as a country, and our firms, our companies, our organizations have to be globally competitive. Uh, we just don't automatically lead the world now. We have to compete with the world. Co-op students uh, have, an, ha have, have an edge in the sense that they understand a little bit more about the real world. They can bring that into their classroom and that makes them a better person going forward. Uh, uh, Co-op is, is not easy to establish. A number of universities have tried uh, a version of Co-op. Uh, and they find out that, first of all, you have to have companies who know you, believe in you, and will send their recruiters there. And RIT has, what, 3,500 uh, companies that recruit here. The careful selection of co-op employers and then careful review of the student's experience. And again, the RIT co-op focused on the student experience, not the numbers that we placed, but rather how valuable was that experience for the student. It's remarkable uh, how many uh, uh, CEOs uh, that you, we, uh, I interact with uh, talk about the co-op program. I remember one in particular from IBM. Uh, the IBM executive I was talking to was absolutely astounded at the work ethic of the students, and secondly, their knowledge and their ability to fit into the IBM work experience. They, uh, they were highly, highly uh, complimentary. You know, last year I visited Toyota on my trips around the country. And I learned that Toyota hires more students from RIT than they do from any other university. And I asked them, you know, why do they go after RIT students so enthusiastically? And their answer was, well, you know, RIT students are true gearheads. <laughs> and I think that to some extent, that says a lot about our co-op program. There's a case at RIT, a situation at RIT. This is a student. Microsoft had a special program. They, they selected six of the top people in the country uh, to, to interview. And uh, he was one of them. The other five were from Stanford, MIT, and the Ivy Schools. After the first day, four were invited back for a second day. After the second day, two were invited back for a third day. After the third day, one was invited to meet with Bill Gates. That was our student. So as you can see, co-op excites me. And again, I want to congratulate RIT 100 years for a program which defines RIT in so many good ways. I believe that this will be a, 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 a joyful time, not alone for the faculties and uh, other staffs of uh, RIT, uh, but uh, this will also loop over into the greater Rochester area uh, because that was always sort of the framework uh, which was first to practice and, and put to work uh, uh, new ideas and innovations when it came to cooperative education. Congratulations to RIT for one of its signature programs, the Cooperative Education Program, on its 100th anniversary. So congratulations, RIT Co-op. You're the best, and we're so proud of you. Happy 100th birthday. As you, could see, I, as you could see, I was not exaggerating when I said that we've enjoyed the support of our senior leaders. And I just do really want to point out, because my very good friend, Al Simone, is here, 
Uh, and, and Al, I, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for all the support that you've provided to us over the years during your presidency. Paul Miller, one of our past presidents, uh, noted in his observations the whole notion of how we were tied into the Rochester and the New York State community. And, and with that kind of very fortunate segue, I'm, I'm really excited to bring now to the podium the Honorable Tom Richards, Mayor of Rochester, and representing the Honorable Maggie Brooks, Monroe County Executive, uh, Judy Seil, who is here to share with us a joint proclamation from the city and the county recognizing RIT's co-op program. What an honor it is to be here today on behalf of County Executive Maggie Brooks to congratulate RIT on 100 years of its co-op program. I just joked to Tom, was he in the first class, the co-op class, but he said no. It was the third, the third class, <laughs> third class. So from County Executive in Monroe County, RIT is a great partner with us, not only in um, the, the college community, but in economic development, and um, we're very pleased to be here today, and I'll let the mayor say a few words also. Thank you, Judy. Um, no, I wasn't in the first class, even though standing next to you I look like it, I know. But, um, but I have had a long association with RIT starting when, when Al was president and I've been on the board and a few other things, so I'm very proud to be here, very proud to recognize this. And also I noticed in the material that you sent to me that the City Engineer's Office was one of the first uh, organizations that had a co-op. And we're going to be recognized here today, we still have co-ops. So we've been part of this from the very beginning and we're proud of it. And so with that, we have a little proclamation here that we're prepared to read, and we'll spare you all of it. You're welcome. Um, but we'll read a little bit of it to get you the idea. Established in September 1912, RIT's Cooperative Education Program is among the oldest in the country. Cooperative education and experiential learning provide students with the opportunity to enrich their traditional higher educational experience by alternating periods of full-time study with periods of full-time work experience. RIT offers one of the largest cooperative education programs in the world, with more than 3,800 students each year and approximately 2,000 employer partners throughout the United States and 40 other countries. RIT's cooperative education program has consistently been recognized as one of the top, one of the top higher education programs in the country by U.S. News and World Report. In addition, RIT's Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services has been nationally recognized by the Princeton Review as one of the top 10 experiential learning offices in the country. In fact, 40% of all program graduates stay, live, and work in the greater Rochester area. Therefore, we, Maggie Brooks, County Executive, and Thomas S. Richards, Mayor, City of Rochester, to hear, hereby proclaim Thursday, October 18, 2012, to be RIT Cooperative Education Program Day. Congratulations, RIT. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Mayor Richards, for those very, very kind words. In a slight change from your formal program, I'd like to ask now for Maureen Dugan, representing the Honorable Louise Slaughter, U.S. Congresswoman, representing the 28th Congressional District of New York, and the Congresswoman's Director of Economic Development, to join me at the podium to share with us the Congresswoman's statement as read into the congressional record. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, I have great news for you. Um, the first is that I am not going to read the entire congressional record. <laughs> And the second piece um, is, is really something quite, quite wonderful, and that is that this is a bipartisan congressional record. That is, uh, Representative Hochul and Representative Reed have joined Louise Slaughter in this, and this shows you how important they all feel that the RIT co-op program is. And with that, I'll read you a condensed version of the congressional record. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is my esteemed honor to celebrate the Rochester Institute of Technology's 100th year of cooperative education. I am joined by the Honorable Kathy Hochul and the Honorable Tom Reed as we congratulate the Rochester Institute of Technology. RIT is home to one of our nation's, to our nation's fourth oldest established cooperative education program. 
Cooperative education provides students with the opportunity to enrich their traditional higher education with, by alternating periods of full-time study with periods of full-time, for credit, paid employment appropriate to their educational and career goals. It is a true testament to the progressiveness of the Rochester area to be home to this long-standing educational program. Through the support of RIT faculty and administration, countless students have expanded their knowledge and skills in the cooperative education program. They have ex been exposed to unique experiences and unparalleled knowledge that has prepared them for successful careers. For 100 years, RIT has dedicated itself to providing these unique learning opportunities and helped to prepare America's next generation for years of success. Today, I stand with Representatives Hochul and Reed to congratulate the Rochester Institute of Technology on its 100th anniversary of enriching countless students through cooperative education. I ask my colleagues to join me in celebration with this momentous occasion. Thank you. I'm pleased now to ask David Seeley to come to the podium and share with us some congratulatory words from New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo. Thank you, Manny. I'm, uh, I'm hitting clean up with the uh, proclamations today, which hopefully won't be like watching the Yankees this postseason. Uh, uh, on behalf of Governor Cuomo, uh, thank you for inviting uh, our office to be a part of this, uh, this great celebration. Um, maybe it's a testament to your government relations staff, but I hear so often about the great things that the college is doing and has plans for the future, but I think it's important to recognize uh, the great things that really made RIT a, a great institution like it is. Um, even before it was the brick city, even before the campus was big enough for me to get lost on, although I would imagine the original campus I still would have gotten lost in. Uh, uh, on behalf of Governor Cuomo, I do have a proclamation. I wanted to read the whole thing, but Mayor Richards stole most of my lines, so I will read a truncated version. Uh, whereas the residents of the Empire State understand, the value, understand and value the importance of education and welcome the opportunity to gratefully acknowledge milestones in the histories of our esteemed institutions of higher learning, the 100th anniversary of the Cooperative Education Program at Rochester Institute of Technology is one such auspicious occasion. Whereas since its founding in 1829, RIT has grown into a nationally recognized private university with 10 colleges. Whereas a testament to its reputation as a national leader in cooperative education, RIT's program has cons consistently been recognized as one of the top programs in the country by US News and World Report. Similarly, RIT's Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services was named one of the top 10 such offices in the country by the Princeton Review. And whereas RIT President Dr. William W. Dessler, the administration, the Board of Trustees, the faculty, staff, students, employer partners, and alumni of RIT, and in particular the Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services, can be deservedly proud as they continue to commemorate this milestone celebration in their school's history. Now, therefore, I, Andrew M. Cuomo, Governor of the State of New York, do by confer this citation in recognition of the 100th anniversary of the Rochester Institute of Technology's Cooperative Education Program with congratulations on a remarkable history and best wishes for continued success for generations to come. Signed, Andrew Cuomo, Governor, October 2012. So on behalf of Governor Cuomo, congratulations on this great occasion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave, so much. Good to see you again. Thank you, Dave. Uh, actually, Dave was batting cleanup uh, without any reference to the New York Yankees out of respect for you, Al, a longtime Boston Red Sox fan. Um, I do want to say through the uh, excellent auspices of uh, Debbie Stendardi, our Vice President for Government and Community Relations, I'm also pleased to tell you why I don't have it in hand, will not be reading from you, uh, President Obama was able to take some little time away from his debate schedule uh, and is in the process of also preparing uh, a congratulatory letter on behalf of our program. So I want to thank you, Debbie, for all your efforts on that behalf, and also now take the opportunity to thank President Obama in advance for his recognition. Now, 
as you've heard, outstanding cooperative education programs are built upon successful partnerships between the academic institution as represented by its faculty and administration, the university's students who are at the core of the enterprise, and the program's employer partners who join in providing these enormously valuable academic and professional development opportunities for our students. Twelve employer partners stood with us in 1912 to launch this program. And I'm so pleased to be able to share with you that five of those organizations still exist today and that four of them could actually send their representatives to join us for this event. Thousands of students have benefited over the many years from working with these organizations. And I'd like to introduce them to you and ask that they join me on the stage to receive a token of our appreciation and thanks to them as legacy employer partners. In helping me with this, I'm asking Louise Caressi, our senior associate director from our team, to join me. Representing Eastman Kodak, Augustin Melendez, Chief Diversity and Talent Officer and Director of Community Relations. <laughs> Representing the City of Rochester, Mark Greger, Manager of Environmental Quality. Representing Rochester Gas and, Ele and Electric, Ibedrola, Sherry Lamaru, Vice President, Human Resources, Raji Ramanan, Director, Talent Management and Diversity, and Alyssa Sakura, Manager of Staffing. And finally, representing Rochester Genesee Regional Transportation Authority, CEO Bill Carpenter. Please join me in a round of applause for these great legacy employer partners and for the nearly 2,000 other hiring organizations that work with us each year. A hundred years produces tens of thousands of successful co-op program graduates. And I'm delighted to tell you that two of the early graduates of the co-op program were able to join us today as representatives of those thousands of co-op alumni. The first of these is Salvatore Sal Deschino, a mechanical engineering graduate of 1936. Sal worked as a co-op for Eastman Kodak and then joined the company upon graduation where he worked until his retirement in 1976. During his more than 40 years at Eastman Kodak, he was part of the team that made the onboard camera systems for the unmanned lunar orbiter program. He helped produce Kodak's pocket instamatic camera and worked with the group that made the first of Kodak's printers. Sal, would you be able to join me up here on the stage so that we can give you a token of our appreciation and thanks. Also, also with us today is Alva Redfield, who graduated in 1941 with a degree in chemistry and began in 1939 at age 18 as a co-op student with the Eastman Kodak Company. Alva was proud to note, by the way, that at that time he earned 45 cents an hour. <laughs> that was more than double what he had been making doing farm work. Upon graduation, Alva went to work full-time for Kodak in the pulp testing laboratory. Of course, however, when you realize when he began to work for Kodak, it became obvious that World War II interrupted his Kodak career. 
and he enlisted early, didn't wait till be 21, he enlisted early, becoming a Navy pilot. He had three years of active duty during the war and two more years during the Korean War stationed in the Mediterranean. In between his years of military service, he returned to Kodak where he retired in 1982. I'd like to thank you too, Al, for all your service as a co-op student and for all that you have done to represent our program. Please join me again, because they're absolutely worth a double applause, in congratulating these two gentlemen and in recognizing the tens of thousands of alumni of RIT's co-op program. Now, I suppose it's only fitting we conclude this part of the program by hearing from a current RIT co-op student. I'm delighted to introduce to you Taylor Deere. Taylor is a business management student in the E. Philip Saunders College of Business. Taylor is really an amazing young man, and as president of student government, we believe an outstanding representative of the amazing students we're truly privileged to work with here at RIT. So Taylor, let me welcome you to the stage. So as Manny said, my name is Taylor. Uh, I'm a fifth year business management student and it is, it is truly an honor to be here uh, as the representative for someone who could speak about the co-op experience. Um, I, I plan to tell a story a little bit more of a story format rather than speaking off a script because this was easily one of the best experiences that I went through in my life. And if my friends or my family or anyone could see me uh, you know, as a freshman and see me up on this stage now, they, they would have laughed because it, it didn't seem possible. So they, I said I was a, a fifth year business management student, but for the first three years of college, I was actually in civil engineering. Um, I love civil engineering, you know, the numbers and working with big equipment, and my dad was a civil engineer, so I was, I was inclined to do it, and I really respected my father for doing it. But it took me three years to realize that my skill set and what I actually loved to do was in something different. And I was much more of a people person. I was much more of talking to people and making connections and building relationships. So I eventually started looking into the business program, and I realized that, you know, that was the right place for me. So after my third year, I decided to switch into business. Um, and as soon as I did, as soon as I sat down in, in my first class, I remember it was on leadership, and I remember looking at the teacher, and I remember looking at the board and be like, wow, I actually understand this. This is fantastic. <laughs> because some, some civil engineering course, you sit down and you go, what did he just say? But it all came natural to me, and it was so exciting, and I was so passionate. I still am passionate about it. And I remember taking a test in an organizational behavior course, and I remember I, remember I got 100%, and, the, and the, the next person down from me got a 70 or 80%. And the teacher called me out, and he said, Taylor, how'd you do that? <laughs> and I looked at him, and I said, just because I, I, I love this. I love this major, and I love this class, and I meant it. So I was so proud that I, that I was doing well, and I was proud that I was in the right major, and I was just full of confidence and pride. So I walked up to the professor whose name is Del Smith, who was teaching organizational behavior, and I asked him for a co-op within his company. And Del said, yeah, sure, let's come in and let's talk about it winter quarter. So I spent the next probably three or four months hardcore preparing for this, because I was so nervous. This is my first business co-op, my first business uh, entity in the first business job, and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so I used the, I used the co-op office. They helped me prepare. They helped me get the questions I needed. They helped me understand what to say, what not to say, what to wear, when to show up, and, and all of the above. And I, I remember being so nervous, even though I was so prepared, because I considered this interview one of the most important, or if not the most important interview of my life, because I knew it would transition me from civil engineer to somewhere where I never can imagine where I am today. So I remember being so nervous, and I remember waking up that day and instantly jumping in my clothes, shirt, tie, pants, socks, shoes, and I remember going up to the door and opening the handle. I looked outside, and it's a blizzard. It was in winter quarter, a blizzard outside. 
and I looked quick at my watch, and I, I was so nervous, I said, I am not going back to get in my jacket. I'm going to show up five minutes early. So there I was, out in the snow, about two feet of snow, walking like this in, in a shirt and tie. Socks like this, shoes like this, freezing my butt off, and I had to walk all the way across campus, shivering. And, but I did it, and I was five minutes early, and I impressed Dell on that, that first impression, because that's how bad I wanted it. So when I sat down, you know, all this preparation, all this, you know, nervousness, Dell sits me down and he says, Taylor, I don't think it's the right time for, for our company. I don't think we can hire you. And it almost broke my heart, but I had all this training and I had all this passion before I told him no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Dell, let's work something out. I want to work for your company. I know I can add something to it. And again, he said, Taylor, I don't think, I don't think this is right. We can't, we're not, we're not well enough to, to hire you right now. And I said, Dell, let's work something out. What, what, you know, I repeated myself. And eventually, it took me three interviews and it took me two denial phone calls for him to accept me within his company, but I eventually did it. And, and I'll tell you, that first day when I sat down, it was the best feeling I could, anyone could ever have because I earned it. I knew that I earned it. Because if I hadn't had this training and I hadn't worked with the co-op office and I hadn't had this passion, I would have been out on the street at that very first interview when he first denied me. And I, I just, again, I want to accommodate the, the co-op office for helping me, help me prepare myself. But within this company, now, I, this was just getting into the company. I hadn't even learned anything. I was still taking business courses. And this role that, that he had in his company was a lot about training sessions and uh, deep change projects within company. And he was more of a, a business consultant more than anything. So I started off at this company, and you know, because you know, he didn't really know who I was, and, and, and because he didn't know the skill set that I had, but he knew I had passion, I did a lot of the research. I did the background work, and I would prepare Dell scripts for these presentations, and that, that was my main job. After about two months, um, he vi finally invited me to the office, and he said, let's come up with a project together. I know you've been doing good on the research. Let's talk about this. So for a few months there, I was helping him develop these things with me and him, the CEO of his company. And then after, after all this time, you know, at the very last couple months of my uh, co-op, he actually offered me the chance to give two two-hour presentations uh, in front of a group of 40 or 50 individuals on situational leadership, and I'll still remember that presentation uh, forever because that was my first one, and I, that was one of the most proudest moments of my life to be able to, to give that speech to that company that we were in. Um, and I just, you know, all this time, the entire time that I was doing this and all the effort and time that I was putting into this, I was also running for the election of student government president, which I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it took me all the time. It took, you know, I would leave work and I would go to bed probably about midnight, straight for work, straight with talking with students, straight to going with, with uh, uh, showing up to groups and giving our campaign slogan and our campaign pitch. And eventually, uh, towards the middle way through a call up, I won. But these last six months, for me, have been the biggest growth and change agent of my life, and I owe it all to the co-op program and my experience with the RIT. So thank you very much for letting me talk. <laughs> See, I wasn't kidding when I said we're privileged to work with some great young, and, young men and women. So again, please join me in thanking Taylor and all of RIT's amazing co-op students. Now, before we turn to our keynote speaker, I want to take this opportunity to say again that a successful co-op program requires an outstanding university with faculty and an administration committed to this educational model, first-rate employer partners providing meaningful and relevant co-op work assignments, and of course, terrifically talented and motivated students. It's also important to note, however, that our success also hinges on the professionalism and competence of the staff of the Office of Cooperative Education and Career Services, who work tirelessly and so effectively to make this program a global model of excellence. I'm asking my team members in the audience to please rise and I hope that you will join me in congratulating them for their efforts on behalf of our students, employer partners, and the university community. Thank you, guys. Now, I'm thrilled now to turn to our keynote speaker, Lindsay Pollock. 
Lindsay is a best-selling author, corporate consultant, keynote speaker, and recognized expert on next-generation career trends. She has over a decade of experience advising both young professionals and organizations on the changing world of work. Lindsay is the author of Getting from College to Career, Your Essential Guide to Succeeding in the Real World, published by HarperCollins, and a global spokesperson for LinkedIn. She has delivered consulting, keynote speeches and seminars for over 100 corporations, universities, and conferences. Clients and audiences have included IBM, Merrill Lynch, Time Incorporated, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, Duke, MIT, and many others. Her advice and opinions have been featured in such media outlets as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Glamour, CNN, NPR, and NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. She appears on several best people to follow on Twitter lists, including Mashable's list of top nonfiction authors on Twitter, and Marie Claire's 100 Twitters every woman should follow. Lindsay is a graduate of Yale University and is based in New York City. Let me welcome to the stage now a great professional and a really good friend, Lindsay Pollack. Thank you so much, Manny. I could not be more honored to be with you today with so many esteemed guests, students, faculty, and other supporters to celebrate 100 years. Uh, Manny asked me to talk about the future today. We've talked a lot about where we've gotten to from 100 years ago to today. I want to think forward to the next 100 years. So students in 1912 hanging out looked something like this. Students in 2012 look a little bit more like this. Taylor, you can back me up on this. I want to think about students in 2020. So not that far into the future, but will they be hanging out with robots? I think if they'll be hanging out with robots anywhere, it would be here at RIT. This is a picture of students who are given the robots at the beginning of the semester and told that by the end of the semester, the robots have to be their teaching assistants and it's their job to program their teachers. This is already happening. I think this is part of the future as well. I want to put this into context of the generations. You saw some of the pictures on the slides coming in of the different generations over the years at RIT, the different facial hair, the different fashions. Here's how I break them down because I'll be using these terms a little bit today. We have the traditionalist, the World War II generation, uh, many of the gentlemen here today. The baby boomer generation comes in. Then the generation Xers, that smaller generation, the Google guys, the independents in their 30s and 40s today. And then we have the millennials who are the students currently at RIT and leading us into the future. And what's really significant, I think, about this year is that we're at an inflection point. You've got the baby boomers retiring, turning traditional retirement age of 65, and you have the millennials turning 30, what we've often thought of as the year that you have to sort of turn into an adult. Britney Spears just turned 30, to put that into context a little bit. So what's happening now is we're seeing the baby boomer generation who are not quite out of the workforce yet, but leadership positions are being taken over by this next generation. So the theme that I'd like you to keep in mind while I'm sharing uh, my seven trends for the future is that I really believe the way to think about where we're going is to look at our students today. So feel free to slouch in your chairs, put on your iPod earbuds, text whenever necessary, um, and think about yourself as the class of 2020 at RIT. This is what I think their reality will be and what you can think about to prepare for the future of co-op education um, as well as your own businesses um, and lives and careers. So I'd like to share seven trends today. And I have a lot of slides with some visuals. So as we put them back, I'll start sharing the seven trends of the future. Thank you. <laughs> future trend number one is I think that we're seeing this really weird meeting of delayed adulthood of young people and early adulthood for young people. And I'll talk you through it and why I think it's significant. First, you've probably heard that this generation 
is the, uh, child they are the children of the helicopter parents, the moms and dads who made sure that everybody had a trophy. These baby on board signs came standard on minivans in the early 1990s. This I love my so-and-so student at junior high school who won uh, honor roll and lots of awards. We had parents who were very involved in parenting this generation. We have a lot of students who come in um, who've gotten a lot of attention, who feel that their parents are their best friends. 56% of millennials say their mom and dad are their best friends. They're moving back home. 58% uh, of millennials say my parents are my best friends. We have people wondering, when does adulthood start these days? A lot of people claim that maybe it's age 26 because you can now stay on your parents' health insurance until 26. And the average age of marriage has gone up significantly over the past 30 years. We see all these trends come together of delayed adulthood. And yet, when you look at the trends in recruiting, you see this concept of, I love that slide. You see this concept of early identification in recruiting. How early can we find the best students? You have companies coming to campuses and looking at the freshmen and helping them move into their dormitories and giving them t-shirts freshman year, saying, learn about my company now. You've got a website called teensintech.com. Teensintech.com is where companies go if they want to recruit high school students to be interns or part-time workers or have summer jobs at their companies. And as I was creating this slide, I noticed, as some of you may have seen, that one company is trying to recruit a teenage chief technology officer. So recruiting earlier and earlier at the same time. And just this week in the Wall Street Journal, cradle to career is an emerging trend. I think my next book title will be Getting from Cradle to Career, that they're calling nursery school the earliest job training program. So on one hand, we have students living at home longer, getting married later, staying on their parents' health insurance, wanting to be kids forever. And on the other hand, you have companies that want to recruit earlier and earlier. So how do these trends meet? What do we think about in the future of how to handle this? I think the very first piece of advice or trend that I would give fits really beautifully with today's theme, which is that co-op education, any kind of experiential learning, is a perfect match for this combination of wanting to have more time to develop as an adult, but having employers who want to recruit you earlier and earlier in your career. I think RIT is so beautifully positioned to serve the millennial generation. I think we're also looking at another trend, which is alumni career services on the other side. I was sitting next to Bob Ferguson, who told me that his career at the same company, starting as an RIT co-op, was 41 years, six months, and 23 days. <laughs> Got it right? You just don't see that anymore. Students are staying for a couple of years. They're coming back to their career services offices. I think we may see co-ops later in life. We may see people coming back for additional degrees. People are not staying at the same employers for 41 days six hours and 23 minutes anymore. The world is really changing and universities have to keep up. Um, as Manny mentioned, I speak at a lot of universities and I would say the biggest change I've seen in 10 years is how many schools now offer their services in career counseling to their alumni. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. And the final trend related to delayed and early adulthood is we have childcare at work today. I think the millennials are gonna wanna have their moms and dads around. So my small prediction a couple years ago was that we would have take your parents to work day. That I used to joke about it. And now Ogilvy Public Relations was the first company that officially started take your parents to work day. And it wasn't like they hid it and just did it as a little program. They sent out a press release announcing that they were now offering Take Your Parents to Work Day as a way to attract younger workers. I think moms and dads will come to work with their kids. So on to our next topic today, the next trend of our seven. Customized career paths. It used to be that people chose a career and rose up the ladder that was generally defined by that industry or by that company. Well, that's not gonna cut it with a generation of people who can now customize every element of their lives. I think the iPod is just the perfect embodiment of that customization. You can not only customize the look of your iPod, but every single song on there. You don't even have to buy an album anymore. 
And there's a, a phrase I wanted to teach you today called iPod overlap, which is take you and your parent, or you and the mayor, and ask how many songs do we have in common on our iPods? And Apple has come out and said that to an unprecedented degree, today's young people have a large iPod overlap with their parents, which the previous generation would not have had. You wouldn't have listened to any music that your parents did. So in customizing your iPad, customizing your Nike sneakers, customizing your chewing gum so that it changes from one flavor to your next favorite flavor, when you grow up with all of this customizability, you expect that you're a university and that your employer will be just as customizable as all this other stuff. So what does that mean? How do we say this, see this playing out? Here's a drawing uh, that a, ch a child did of a little girl, perhaps a princess. For the millennial generation, there's a website now called childsown.com, where if you want to take the imagination of your child and turn it into reality, you can send in that child's drawing, and they will turn it into a real live toy that takes their imagination and turns it into reality. We expect this now in the workplace and in our universities. There's been an 85% jump in the number of double and triple majors in higher education because young people come in and say, yeah, I don't really just want to major in English. I want to major in English and orthodonture and massage therapy. And we say, fantastic. And then it's the job of career services to find you a job that will integrate these three things. So kudos to the career services uh, team. I know how hard uh, your work is. So what's happening, which I find really interesting, is that students are not going in now to companies and saying, oh, I see, now the rules change. Growing up was like this. Going to college was like this. But now employer will have it your way. They're walking in and saying, you need to change all this to fit what I want. And what I found interesting is that many companies are making these changes. Uh, Deloitte was the first company to come out with a program that they call mass career customization, where every employee of Deloitte has his or her own dashboard of what their career will look like. What pace will their work be? Will they be an individual contributor or a manager? How many people will they manage? And so forth from the CEO of the organization to every administrative assistant, every IT support person, they each have their own career pathing plan at Deloitte. I just looked on the website of PwC, a Deloitte competitor, and when you go to their careers page, the headline says, it's all about you. A career at PwC is all about you. This is what employers are using, and I think that the employers who employ co-ops are ahead of the game because they see what today's students want. They see how the workforce is changing, and they're adapting to that in the way they're offering different career tracks. So on our topic of career customization, and here's an example of what those dashboards look, at, look like at Deloitte. Uh, I talked about the 41-year career. Fast Company just did a story on the four-year career, which means that one of the most common career paths today is to do something completely different every four years of your career. Uh, and it used to look, uh, be looked at negatively to have so much jumping around on your resume. Now it's becoming the norm. So what does this mean? What should we look for? Again, coincidentally, I thought that the co-op program fit really well into this topic. Um, expanded opportunities will encourage experimentation. You won't have to customize your career so much once you're in the workforce if you're, ab if you're able to have this time to experiment while you're still a student. What else? Portfolios versus resumes. Um, as you heard, I'm a representative of LinkedIn. They recently pur purchased SlideShare, which is the ability to add PowerPoint slides or any other visuals to your LinkedIn profile, given the idea that just listing what you've done is no longer the best representation of your work. You need to be able to show people what you're able to accomplish because we have different types of careers today. And finally, I predict that we'll have a job title called Institutional Memory Consultant. When you no longer have people who've been at a company for 41 years or longer or 20 years or even 10 years, how do you know what the history of that organization is? We need people who will come in and talk about how things have been done, why things have been done a certain way. So I think a great consulting career of the future is to go back to organizations where you've worked and give people an idea of how things have evolved. 
On to our third trend today. Work is not a place. This is certainly not news to any of us. Some of you may be checking your devices while sitting in this room and doing some work. But how does this affect the next generation? How does it affect recruiting? How does it affect all of us who are in business or in universities thinking about where and how people work? When I go into corporations, this is a common sight that I see on the tables in front of all of the participants, which is that they have two devices. One is for work, one is for personal. And what I find really interesting is that they tell me I have the same stack at home. I have my personal device and my work device. There's so much more of a blurring of the line between work and home. And for the millennial generation who's never known anything different, they have no problem doing work while they're home and asking for personal time while they're in the office. When it comes to school, this back and forth between education and the workforce, I don't think it's coincidental that there's been a 74% rise in homeschooling. School is not a place either. And if you grow up knowing that some kids go to school at home and some kids go to school in a building together, it makes you feel that the workplace will probably be reflected of that as well. Teleconferencing and virtual reality, I couldn't resist putting up an election-related slide since we're getting close. Do you remember in the 2008 election when Wolf Blitzer would have holograms of people coming into the studio? I don't see why in the future I couldn't speak to you that way as a hologram in the room. Or why people from various companies around the world couldn't speak by hologram to the students at RIT. We're very close to not requiring business travel for as many people, we've already gone there. The teleconferencing meetings are so good now that you can actually have sidebar conversations when you're in the middle of a teleconference. That's how good the technology is. But it makes you question what happens to those personal relationships. Can you really develop as strong of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody in business or in any element if you don't have that actual human connection? And I think that's a question that we're not really sure of the answer to yet. Trend watch on work is not a place. First, I think we'll see a lot more co-working environments and services. If you don't have to work together with your colleagues, you can have a lot more collaboration, a lot more cross-discipline uh, by people working in large warehouses. We already see it at Starbucks, people doing business with those who work in other organizations because they're not in an office. I think virtual reality and augmented reality will go mainstream. We already have Skype. Many of us already participate in FaceTime conversations. We're going to see that evolve a lot more. And finally, the last trend is that I think we'll see expanded opportunities with people who have different abilities. If you don't need to be in an office, if you don't need to walk into a building, if you can use various forms of technology for speech recognition, for any kind of activity that opens up a whole realm of opportunities for people who haven't traditionally been included in a lot of work opportunities and situations. Our fourth topic today, I created a new word, which I can't wait to see how it's interpreted, entrepreneurishness. Entrepreneurishness is the idea that I think a lot of us really, really want to be entrepreneurs, but not really. So what does that mean for the millennial generation? I also call it the Zuck effect. You could not have a conversation about millennials and not show Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of Facebook. Uh, he was uh, Time's Person of the Year when he was 26 years old for creating Facebook. And when I think about the millennial generation, and Taylor, you're going to have to give me a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down on this if you agree. I sort of believe that all of your friends secretly believe that they could have been Mark Zuckerberg. True. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that a lot of young people think, I could have created a business like that in my dorm room. I have a computer. I have an internet connection. I have ideas. Could have been me. And think they could have been the billionaire, but they weren't necessarily the one who created it. So I think this desire to be an entrepreneur is very American, the American dream, starting a business, growing something. But how does it change for the millennial generation? You see this amazing statistic that 70% of high school students say that at some point they would like to work for themselves. You hear a lot in the media now about young entrepreneurs and young entrepreneurship, which I think is a wonderful trend to spread. However, I think that the trend, in my opinion, is a desire to be an entrepreneur, but not actually jumping into entrepreneurship. Look at the numbers. In 1975, 
there were 351,000 young people aged 16 to 24 who started their own businesses. You would think that today, given technology, given the opportunities, given the enthusiasm for entrepreneurship in this generation, we would see a huge jump in this number. The reality is, the number has only gone up to 400,000. So what do I make of these numbers? What I make of it is that everybody wants to feel like an entrepreneur while still being employed by a company, which brings us to a company like Google, which also needs to be talked about in any conversation about the future, I'm sure. Google's very famous for offering something called 20% time, which means that you can spend 20% of your paid employment working hours at Google, working on anything you want. Gmail was invented during 20% time. I think that this idea that you can be an entrepreneur within your organization is very appealing to the millennial generation. I can create something, I can be innovative, I can be unique, but I can still get a paycheck and benefits is very appealing to this generation, 20% time. And LinkedIn actually recently did a study on the most in-demand employers in the world, and they broke it down to students and recent grads. And what they found on their list of students and recent grads is that Google is the number one most desired employer by millennials, and I think that's a sign. We're starting to see this concept of 20% time. Some companies call it hack days, where anyone can hack an idea of a project. At LinkedIn, they call it in days. Uh, they had a day last year on Veterans Day where everybody's project was to think of a way that LinkedIn could help our country's veterans. I think this idea of giving people time for innovation in a company is a great way to please the millennial generation and also a complete opportunity for experiential learning when you have young people coming to, into an organization with those new exciting ideas. So what are the trends to watch when it comes to entrepreneurishness? I think we'll see increased entrepreneurial training. 80% of universities now offer entrepreneurship training. Here at RIT, you have an entrepreneurship center. Students want this training, and they may become entrepreneurs at some point in their lives, but they certainly want the training. I think we're gonna see moonlighting. I think people are gonna have jobs, and on the side, they're gonna start Etsy businesses, or internet businesses, or work with their friends to create a social enterprise. But having more than one job is so important right now to this younger generation who really wants to make their mark. The number one question I get from people about LinkedIn is how do I design a LinkedIn profile when I do more than one thing? And we, know, we don't yet have a model for how to describe a career that's not one trajectory, and I think that's something that we're gonna need to see in the future. And the final issue with entrepreneurishness is that I think this concept of hack days will go mainstream. Can we all work on an issue? Can we bring people together to get outside of their regular job and think about bigger issues? I know some companies are more uh, conservative than others, so instead of a hack day, it might be a hack 15 minutes. But some time to step out of your role and think about the future, um, and I encourage all of us to do that. And having young people in your organization is one of the best ways to bring about that culture. Future trend number five today, leading out loud, and those of you who are really good with your internet text message speak will notice LOL. I was the last person in the world to uh, not know that LOL meant laugh out loud. I thought it meant lots of love, and I used to get really uncomfortable when people wrote it in business emails. I didn't <laughs> quite get that at the time. Uh, so leading out loud are just a few predictions I have about our next generation of leaders, about our tailors, about the young people who are going to be the leaders and increasingly are the leaders of the future. Uh, a few years ago, I was only doing trainings on managing the millennial generation, and I've seen a subtle shift, I'd say in the past year, of companies coming in and saying, well, what happened was the millennials became the managers, so now we have to train them as managers. They're not the kids anymore. Um, they grew up, so what do we do with that information? How are they going to lead? And I think the key to their leadership relates to their use of technology. They're digital natives. I love this picture. Um, I have a 15-month-old daughter, and she has an iPad and an iPod touch. We call it a hand-me-down because they were my husband's devices, um, but some of you may be on the other side. There's a new concept called hand-me-ups which is when you finish with your technology and you give it to your parents. So some of you may be the recipient of hand-me-ups. 
So the millennials are digital natives. They grew up clicking a mouse before reading a book. How does that change the way you think? How does that change the way you lead? There are a lot of different issues related to being a digital native, um, and you probably observe this if you have millennials on your team. First is the belief that everything can be shared. Because it can, should it, is really the most important question. You know, I went to opening day um, at City Field, um, the Mets Stadium, when it opened a couple of years ago, and I remember it was the moment of the first pitch, and I looked out from our not very good seats, and every single person I saw had their device getting ready to tweet about it or Facebook it, and I thought, nobody's actually watching the moment, which for Mets fans can sometimes, you know, help you cope, but at the moment, at the moment, I realized that we share everything and sometimes we don't take it in. With this generation, there are huge issues related to privacy, which we'll talk about a lot. It's actually Data Privacy Month. And the concept that everything that you are given at work cannot necessarily be shared. You can't necessarily share your work product and send it home to your parents, ask them to edit it, and have them email it back to you. Intellectual property, all of these issues are really coming up with this generation. And for leaders, what do you share with your employees? Mark Zuckerberg came out when Facebook went public, and he said, I am going to be a transparent leader. I am going to tell you everything, whether you like it or not. And I'm sure a lot of people had mild heart attacks who are invested in that company and are on the board, because he said, I'm going to tell you everything. Tony Shea of Zappos blogged every company meeting, sent out every company memo, and made it public. What happens when you have leaders and the other question is, how true is that? Are people sharing what they think they can share, or are they truly sharing everything? So this issue of transparency um, is really hot with the millennials, and we'll see how it plays out. Salary transparency is related to this. Uh, there have been certain organizations where the CEO has listed his or her salary and asked other employees to list their salaries publicly, not necessarily on name tags. But the idea that if pay is made open, how does that change employee and employer relationships? This is your gratuitous ab photo from Men's Health Magazine. Some of you in government may recognize this as Congressman Aaron Schock from Illinois. He's from Peoria, Illinois. Congressman Schock is a millennial. He's 28 years old. In his second term in Congress, he was our first millennial congressman. And I think it's interesting to note that he felt comfortable as a United States congressman to show his abs on Men's Health Magazine. The leaders of the future want you to see that they have a life outside of their jobs and outside of their roles. And I think it's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out with the millennials, who pretty much all have a track online of what they've done throughout their lives. Will it change our opinions of what information we accept in public because everybody has that digital trail. Trend watch, trend number one for leading out loud is will we have more attractive and buff congressmen, I think is a fair question. <laughs> Those of you in the front section here uh, to ask because everything will be a little bit more transparent. Other topics, data, 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 data. Everything right now is collecting data. I was at a university who said that they just added keypads to all of their doors. And the student said, well, who owns that data? Are you going to tell my parents what time I came home at night? Are you going to tell my employers what rooms and what dorms and what classrooms I've entered and exited? Students are very savvy about their data and who owns it. And I don't think that we've kept our policies up yet with all of these issues that young people are very, very savvy about. Uh, and I think that's the next trend, is that privacy laws will have to catch up with reality. Very interestingly, when the students pose that question, who owned that data, the administration, I think, uh, very honestly said, we don't know, because we have never had this ability before. What are the policies? I think data engineering um, is one of the huge trends of the future, and, and certainly, I'm sure, popular with students here at RIT, the idea that we have so many reams of data. How do we get through all of that information? And the final trend here kind of relates to what I was alluding to with Mark Zuckerberg and others, is that what is real transparency? What is real privacy? A lot of people say that everything is going to be transparent. They're going to blog everything. And then what we're seeing is a rise in private invitation-only social networks. So I might put everything on LinkedIn, but I'm secretly a member of an online network that is invitation-only. 
A lot of people ask me, what do you think about the fact that everybody has constant data coming at them? Everybody's on their devices. Everybody's connected to technology. I think it will become a total luxury product and very, very expensive to actually get away. So the idea that you can be somewhere where nobody can bother you, the idea that you'll be turned off from technology will be considered a luxury product that not everybody necessarily has access to. On to our sixth of seven trends today. Cross-cultural competency, a huge issue of globalization. I think all of our speakers talked about it today. One element of being a digital native is that you have access to the entire world from a very young age. This generation is absolutely savvy about the fact that they are not competing with the person in the seat next to them. They're competing with everybody in the world at every stage of their careers. But I wanted to define cross-culture really broadly. Um, the first issue is on international students. You can see a chart here. Since 1975, the number of mobile students who studied outside of their home country has grown by almost 350%. And the students who study outside of their country often want to stay in the, study, in the country uh, where they've studied. This leads to a huge visa issue, which is certainly not news to anyone who works in higher education, the H-1B visa issue. We have wonderful students who come here, and they're not able to stay and work. Has anyone heard about Blue Seed? Peter Thiel, who's a big Silicon Valley investor, had invested in this program. Um, Blue Seed is opening in 2013. It is essentially a huge cruise ship that is being outfitted as an entrepreneurial center. It is just far enough off the coast of California, off of Silicon Valley, that it is considered to be an in international waters. So it will be an incubator for entrepreneurial ventures where people from various countries can come together with funding from Blue Seed to start businesses together. They can get visitor visas to travel on shore when they need to go shopping or have meetings. But it is an international incubator for business um, just off the shores. I think we're going to see a lot of these issues. And interestingly, and I found this really encouraging, one of the questions they asked Peter Thiel was, well, why not just do it virtually? Why not have everybody work from home and sit in front of their computers? And he said, no, people need to be together face to face from other cultures to start the best businesses we can start. So I think we're going to see this. The phrase for it, um, if you think of homesteading, they call this seasteading, which is starting businesses and communities out at sea. I think it's going to be a really interesting trend to watch um, that, again, is launching next year. I would also consider cultural, cross-cultural competency to, competency to include not just people from other countries, not just people with different abilities, not just people who are different from us, but also robots and computers. Many of us talk to computers every single day on the phone. We talk to them through Siri on our iPhones. Watson competed on Jeopardy. This is a reality. This is living in the future, the Jetsons. I think one of the biggest trends of management in the future is going to be teaching people how to manage robots and robot interaction and possibly robot therapy and psychology. So when you're interacting with robots, you need to know how to code. You need to know how to program computers. At several universities in this country, computer programming can fulfill your foreign language requirement. And what Code Year has done, this is a free service, Code Year teaches people to code in one lesson a week for an entire year. I think we're going to see more and more people believing that coding, computer programming, is now an essential skill. We'll have the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and coding. And if anyone can think of a way to turn that into an R, um, you probably have a, a good business model, or at least a good URL, that you could sell to people. The idea that coding is now crucial is very important. As I said, I have a 15-month-old, and all my friends are putting their kids in Mandarin Chinese lessons. And my husband said, no, we're going to teach her how to code. And that's going to be her future. That'll get her into RIT. And the next topic is that I think we're going to have an entirely new career called Cheryl's. Cheryl Sandberg is the chief operating officer of Facebook. Many people credit her um, in babysitting Mark Zuckerberg and making sure that the company did okay. Cheryl is fantastic at managing techies. 
I think the idea of business people who are good at managing people who speak a different language, meaning they speak the language of technology, is going to be a really important job in the future, particularly for us liberal arts majors. Um, I know at Disney they have people who just manage the artists because the artists need to focus on the artwork. Uh, there are people in finance who do all the work around the people who manage the money so they can just manage the money. I think the idea that we are going to have to let technical people just speak that language and interact and others of us will be interpreters of that language uh, will be something in the future. And at one of my presentations, Manny, I think you were there, somebody jumped up and said, thank you for describing what I am. I'm a Cheryl. So if there are any Cheryls in the audience, I think you definitely have a strong career path in the future. But I do think almost all of us will need to be fluent in some technology speak, in some version of HTML, in some technical ability, because it will be the same as communicating with people from different backgrounds. So trend watch on cost cu cultural competency, study abroad and international co-op experience going to other places and learning how to interact with people. The fact that Peter Thiel said people need to be on that offshore boat together. We cannot work together across cultures without meeting face to face. I just don't think that's going to go away. And I think the fact that RIT is now sending students to 200 countries means that this school will keep its excellence in the co-op area because you really understood that this has to be a global program. Uh, computer programming meeting foreign language requirements I mentioned, and robot management, the idea that we won't just be managing people in the future. Um, I think we'll see that as probably a course offered in business schools in the future. And our last topic goes to the other end, which is design. RIT is technical and also has a wonderful arts program. Design certainly related to technology, uh, but it's our last topic today and kind of a fun one. Uh, the late Steve, jo Steve Jobs, I think, is the father of this trend. Uh, think different at Apple. He focused so much on design. If any of you read his biography, he talked about how he was obsessed with the look, the visual design of the part of the iPhone that was inside the packaging that nobody could see. That's how important design was. And if you look around, we've all become designers in one way or another because we've not only been exposed to Apple products, but so many other elements of design have become part of the normal working world and certainly of business decisions today. Chief design officers are the newest C-suite job. PepsiCo, for the first time ever this June, hired a chief design officer. Going to design school, uh, Fast Company wrote, is the new MBA. The idea that design is so important to our products and services. 3D printing, which I'm sure is going on all over campus. I asked the career services and co-op team to throw out any word when we had a meeting that I should look up on LinkedIn to help students find their careers. And somebody yelled out, 3D. They're all talking about 3D. Um, this is Jay Leno. He's into classic cars. He owns a 3D printer. I think they run about $37,000, $38,000. And when he runs out of a part that is no longer manufactured, his 3D pin printer can take the part and recreate it. We are going to have 3D printers in all of our homes, and we are going to be making things all the time. And I was reading an article by an investor in this technology, and he said one of the uh, fellow investors he was meeting with to try to give him money said, why would anyone need a 3D printer in their home? And he said, didn't somebody say to Bill Gates, why would anyone want a computer in their home? He said, every single one of us is going to have a 3D printer. They're using 3D printers to create human limbs. This is going to change the future, and everybody is going to have one. We are all going to be designers. We could take a product and say, you know, I really like this shoe, but I wish it had a bow on it, and I can recreate that shoe with a bow. We are all going to be designers in the future. Cool, right? I think that's kind of cool. Pinterest. How many of you are on Pinterest? Anyone getting married? Very popular with brides to put all of their bridal uh, interest. The newest social network, the fastest growing social network ever, the most number of people who joined it is Pinterest, where people post visuals. And what I found really interesting is right when it started, people chose to create their resumes in a visual format and post them on Pinterest. So if you look here, it's a little bit hard to see, but every single one of these pins is somebody who designed a resume in a visual format. So people immediately took this creative site of Pinterest and used it as a way to advance their careers. 
and to present themselves in different ways. One of the things I love about the millennial generation is they've taken what we all accepted as the way things are. A resume looks like this. And they've said, well, I think a resume should look like this. And they've posted it publicly. Other people have caught on. And that's how they're changing the culture. How many of you have emoji on your phones? Emoji are emoticons, like a little smiley face, gone wild. Uh, these come out of Asia. You can see there are emoji for absolutely everything, any kind of image, any kind of visual, little icons of Halloween pumpkins and Santa Claus and smiley faces. When my husband's hungry, he sends me a knife and fork emoticon by text message. And people are now writing novels entirely in emoticons. It's not that much of a leap that you could read an entire book, that you could have an entire memo that you could write a press release entirely in visuals as opposed to words. The creativity is out there. And just to prove it, as one of our last slides tonight, there is a blog called Narratives in Emoji. Please raise your hand or call out if you can identify what film this emoji is telling the story of. Titanic, could somebody volunteer to interpret these emoji of Titanic and tell the plot of the film for anyone who isn't able to see it. Would you stand up and describe for us the emoji of Titanic, if we can put that image up on the screen. He painted a picture of her. with an iceberg thrown in, yeah, in the middle. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the world is changing. We're becoming more visual. We're entrepreneurial, but we still want to work for employers. We're cross-cultural. We're talking to robots. So much is changing. And the message that I wanted to get across today is that RIT has come so far in 100 years. The co-op program is such a leader. I think if we look to the students, we will see where we're going in our next 100 years. And I hope that those of you who are in industry will really listen to those students and understand that they are leading us into the future. All of these trends are just a small, small sliver of what young people are going to bring us into. And I'm very excited to see where this takes us. I also wanted to throw a trivia question at you to wrap up tonight, which is what year did the Titanic sink? 1912, which brings us back to the 100-year celebration of cooperative education at RIT. Thank you very much. And I believe if there's any interest, we have time for a handful of questions. How excited was I to have that narratives and emoji and then learn that the Titanic sunk in 1912? <laughs> As a speaker and slide designer, that was a cool moment. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, hi. Uh, well, many of the new social computing uh, sort of things you know, sort of take different directions. Uh, how many directions, too many directions? So all the social networks? So the question is, there's so many social networks, even some started here on campus, how many is too many? I actually think we're going to see more and more and more, and I think if you watch the development of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, they're making smaller communities within their platform. There's a term called hyper-niche marketing, which means that I would like to network or be in a community with brown-haired women from New York who are professional speakers who wear blue suits. And I'm going to find that community and social network where I want to find it. So I think for things like employment matching, we'll have larger sites. But I think for any social network that finds a community and an audience, it will probably still exist. 
which is why a lot of people predict, and you know, rightly so with Google, that the most important trend of the future is data mining and search, because finding that little community that you want is going to be the hardest part, but I think they will all exist. Where there's a community, where there's a group of people who want to hang out with each other, I think they'll create those networks. Will they all make money and be businesses? No, I think that's where you're going to see the drop off of who actually becomes a business and what stays kind of a grassroots effort. Thanks for the question. So the question is, I showed that among 16 to 24 year olds, not the general population, but among 16 to 24 year olds, the number of entrepreneurs has not gone up. The question is, is there anything we need to do about it? I think the opportunities are there. I question if the desire is there. If a lot of people want to be entrepreneurial, but not necessarily start businesses, um, I think providing the tools that we have, I think the ship you know, oversee, uh, uh, off the coast of Silicon Valley is a great solution to say, well, maybe people are starting businesses in other countries, or maybe they're choosing not to start a business because of you know, issues. Um, I think that the communities that support entrepreneurship get the entrepreneurs. I think study Silicon Valley, and I would ensure that a large percentage of those 500,000 are in Silicon Valley. I think if a community supports entrepreneurship, people flock there. I also think it's really interesting that a lot more startups are recruiting on campuses now. You know, smaller companies want co-ops. Smaller companies want to come to campus. And because of technology, they don't have to recruit at the size of an IBM to be able to get the top students in the country. Um, so I think the more that companies realize that they can source talent on campus, the more we'll encourage that entrepreneurship. But I also think it's cool to start a company on the side. You know, and I wonder how many people report themselves as entrepreneurs when it's not their primary effort. So I would question the statistic as much as, as the reasoning. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Hi. So the question is about data. Do we need courses? How do we alert people that every single email they send, anything they do with technology, every time they swipe their credit card, the data is being collected? I think that the technology is light years ahead of the education, the law, and people's understanding. I think we have no idea yet how much is being collected and what's being done with it. Um, and I would like to see more people think about that issue and make it public, I think we're going to see huge public movements to address this issue because we're just simply not keeping up with the ability that's out there. Follow. So the comment is that students you know, need to know that things are being saved, things are being looked at. I think education is part of it, but I think one of the challenges for all of us, students in particular, is that the technology is so appealing that we may know that that data is being collected or can be saved, but it's very hard to stop yourself in the moment from the ease of doing it. You know, I think that we all make those decisions every day. Um, what's interesting is I think some people have decided that the way to address it is to create technology that gets around it. So there was just an app released where you could take a picture, send it to somebody, and it would disappear in five seconds. And so somebody created the technology to say, well, nobody can save that phone. Well, guess what? Somebody else realized, well, if you take a screenshot in those five seconds, I can keep the picture. So it's like we're all trying to catch up with ourselves and see what's possible. But I, I think 
you know, we look back and say, you know, you watch Mad Men, how could men have treated their secretaries that way? And, you know, how could we all have done these things? I think we will look back in the very near future and say, how did we not realize that all of this was happening? How did we not know that all of our data was being collected? I think we will all be surprised at ourselves because it's all happening. And, you know, many of the companies that I work with in social media, you know, you think that they're making their money from your fee that you're paying or from advertising. They're making their money by selling the data that they're collecting. So it's a, tr a huge business model that we need to be aware of. So I think awareness is the first step. Um, and then, you know, the law and businesses will catch up. But to directly answer your question, any student you can tell any minute of the day to be careful what they put in writing is probably a really smart thing to do. Thank you. Mark? So the question is, given how busy we all are and how much data is coming at us, how do we help students learn to deep think and chill out and have time for reflection? I'm hugely concerned about this issue as a mother of a young child. I joke about her having an iPad, but how do you learn imagination? How do you learn creativity when you have a device in front of your face? You know, play is important. Messing around is important. Thinking time is important. And there was a fantastic documentary, if you're interested in this topic, on PBS Frontline called Digital Nation. And it talks about the fact that the brain of children today is actually different because of technology, that they're not able to stop and think for long periods of time, that they're used to that constant interruption. So I think, number one, it has to be taught. We have to teach children to relax and chill out. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but to them, it's not something that they know how to do. I know a lot of companies who are extremely concerned about the fact that people don't have long think time. There are certain projects that you need to stop and think and not be interrupted for hours on end, and we have forgotten how to do that. Um, so I think it probably starts now, addressing it with children. And I put up the slide of cradle to career jokingly, but I do think it's important to think about how we're educating the youngest people it's too late for you RIT students. You're already, you're already too busy. Um, but I also think it will be a luxury item, you know, that, that the higher you are in a company, the more able you'll be to close your door. There are also technologies now that will turn off your email for a certain amount of time. They will black it out to force you to think. I think we're going to invent devices and pay for things that force us into those situations of relaxing and thinking. But when the brain starts to change, you know that you have a big issue for sure. But we also have to be diligent. In, in the classroom, telling people to turn off their devices. In the office, turning off our own devices in a meeting and show people that we respect that time because I think, you know, I talk about my daughter and she shouldn't be in front of her device and I have to catch myself if I'm on my device in front of her. You know, so we need to be good models of what is really needed and particularly the business leaders in the room need to realize that they're setting that example. Really important issue, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor. Happy birthday, RIT. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, that was a tremendous keynote address, and I hope um, you believe me when I told you that you would enjoy the, the time Lindsay is, uh, that was able to spend with us. Um, I'd like to conclude our program, uh, and in doing so, I'd like to extend some thanks. Uh, first, our interpreters, who we take for granted here at RIT, uh, and we're really, truly blessed to have their skills and their ability to expand our communication. Thank you. Uh, you've seen um, a, a fair number of visuals, including some amazing video and montage efforts, and I really want to say thank you to our Educational Technology Center team and the various folks uh, who help put these things together, who you never really see because they're in the back room, kind of running everything. And I know they can see me right now. So let me send a big shout out to you folks for doing an amazing job and making this such a great experience. 
And thanks again. Um, there are students here, there are employers here, there are representatives of the university here, and all of you have contributed so much to the success of our program. Uh, and I can tell you, I can speak on behalf of those students and others who have benefited. Thank you so much for the care and concern that you have extended to this program over such a long period of time. So uh, please join us uh, in a reception uh, that we're hosting. If you go outside of the the front doors to Ingle and make a right. You'll see some people that will help direct you to the Davis Room in the cafeteria, and we hope to see you and have a chance to chat with you very, very soon. Thank you all so much for participating in this event, and safe travels.